coming up on this Wednesday edition of Daybreak. Islamic State releases a video appearing to show a captured Jordanian pilot being burned alive. US President Barack Obama says the killing shows the group's viciousness and barbarity. The defense chiefs of South Korea and China will meet in Seoul today for talks on the military and nuclear threat posed by North Korea and the current security situation on the peninsula. First, President Park Geun-hye calls for greater coordination between the cabinet and the presidential office in a bid to slow her slumping approval ratings. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, February 4th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. And we start with the latest and most horrific act of murder yet by the extremist group that calls itself Islamic State. In a 22-minute long video and still images released within the last few hours, Jordanian pilot Muath al Khazazbe appears to have been locked inside a cage and then burned alive. The video, which we will not be showing you here on Aridang, begins with a condemnation of Jordan's king for joining hands with the US in its military coalition against Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. Jordanian State TV said Khazaz Bey was killed on January 3rd, so over a month ago. King Abdullah says the pilot's murder was an act of cowardly terror by a deviant group with no relation to Islam. World leaders, including US President Obama, have also condemned the murder in the strongest possible terms. Reports say Jordan's response will include the prompt execution of Iraqi militant Sajida al-Rashawi and other IS-linked members held in Jordan's prisons. Uh, Khazaz Bey was captured when his jet crashed in Syria during a bombing mission against IS in December. Back here in Korea and stung by slumping approval ratings, President Park Geun-hye has announced plans to establish smoother coordination between the top office and her cabinet. The president hopes the move will reassure the public that she is listening to their concerns. Our Che Sun reports. Amid a public backlash over the government's tax policy revisions and its suspension of reforms to the National Health Insurance Program, President Park Geun-hye called for greater coordination between the cabinet and her office. 새로 신설이 되는 정책 조정 협의회를 통해서 청와대와 내각 간의 사전 협의와 조율도 강화해 나가기를 바랍니다. She emphasized that officials must clearly understand how a policy will affect the lives of the public through simulations and data analyses. Otherwise, she said its purpose will eventually be defeated. The president did not, however, respond to bipartisan calls for administration to decide between increasing taxes to add welfare benefits or scaling down on welfare to avoid raising taxes. Earlier on Tuesday, ruling party leader Kim Musang had heavily criticized President Park's election pledge to increase welfare without a tax hike. A recent poll showed 65 percent of Korean people thought it would be impossible to expand welfare without raising taxes. I agree with them, and it would be wrong for a politician to deceive the public by promising more welfare without raising taxes. Instead, Kim said the priority should be to review where the welfare budget is being spent and to seek ways to reduce expenses before opting to raise taxes. As for the government's backtracking on health insurance reforms, Kim vowed to initiate better communication between the party, government and presidential office. Choi yoo Arirang News. And President Park's comments on coordinating the presidential office in the cabinet came shortly after the newly elected floor leader of the ruling Senuri party also called for changes to regain the public's trust. He says the president and the party are facing a crisis, but this, this time can actually serve as an opportunity to make some major improvements, our Lee reports. 
For the ruling party's new floor leader, Yu Seung Min, his win wasn't about an anti President Park Geun camp defeating a pro Bok faction. For him, it signaled a chance for the ruling camp to reform and rebound ahead of next year's general elections. With President Bok's approval ratings at their lowest level since she took office, Yu is calling for policy changes to win back the hearts of a disappointed public. Pointing to criticism of the president's personnel picks, Yu told reporters that President Bok must carry out a drastic shakeup of her people. As for policymaking, he believes the party should take a stance vis a vis the presidential office. To do that, he says the party should no longer just support whatever the presidential office lays out in front of them. Instead, the party should play a leading role in setting the agenda for the nation. Yu, however, did promise to improve communications and cooperation with the government to iron out differences before putting major policies into motion. In response to the government's push to increase taxes to cover welfare benefits, he said it's either higher taxes with more benefits or lower taxes with less welfare, not more welfare without a tax hike. Political analysts say the new floor leader's eagerness for change could turn the page for the ruling camp. But it remains to be seen whether the presidential office will lend an ear to his criticisms and demands. Lee Jun, Arirang News. Now, Chinese Defense Minister Chang Wan Chian is in Seoul for a three day visit to hold talks with his South Korean counterpart, Han Minggu. On this Wednesday, topping the agenda will be military and nuclear threats from Pyongyang and the current security situation on the Korean Peninsula. They will also discuss ways to further boost bilateral cooperation, including the establishment of a direct military hotline between Seoul and Beijing. Chang is just the third Chinese defense minister to visit South Korea. The last time a Chinese defense minister came to Seoul uh, was all the way back in 2006. The top nuclear envoys from South Korea and China will meet in Beijing today for talks on efforts to denuclearize North Korea. Seoul's foreign ministry says Huang Jungkook and his Chinese counterpart Wu Dawei will not only discuss ways to prevent North Korea from further developing its nuclear weapons program, but also talk about the possibility of reviving the stalled six-party denuclearization talks that were last held in 2008. The two envoys will be resuming where they left off uh, during their last round of talks last October. Now, this meeting today follows trilateral talks in Tokyo last week. This among the nuclear envoys of South Korea, the US and Japan, on bringing North Korea back to those six-party talks. Now, reports have been emerging in recent days that the United States and North Korea have been mulling the idea of holding discussions on resuming formal high-level talks. This comes as the two sides, in public at least, have been blaming each other for the current deadlock. Our Huang Sang-i reports. Washington began the new year imposing more sanctions on North Korea. But behind the scenes, the two longtime foes have reportedly been discussing the prospects of restarting dialogue. Citing multiple sources, The Washington Post reported Monday that U.S. Special Envoy for North Korea Policy Sung Kim proposed to meet with North Korean officials in Beijing. This ahead of his trip to Tokyo last week for a trilateral meeting with his South Korean and Japanese counterparts. The report says the North offered to send Ri Young-ho to Beijing or suggested the U.S. diplomat visit Pyongyang for a meeting with Kim Gye-gwan and Kang seok ju who are both more senior in the foreign ministry than Li. On a similar note, Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency reported Tuesday that Sun Kim's offer didn't materialize because the North insisted on holding the talks in Pyongyang. This comes as the two sides blame each other for the deadlock in dialogue. Following the trilateral meeting in Tokyo, the U.S. diplomat reiterated the conditions for talks. North Koreans will need to demonstrate uh, its commitment to denuclearization in a concrete manner before we can resume any serious negotiations. North Korea lashed out over the weekend, saying Washington rejected its invitation. But the regime seems far from committed to giving up its nuclear ambitions. Recent satellite imagery shows fresh activity at North Korea's main nuclear plant, a possible indication a reactor there was being restarted. Hwang Sang-i, Arirang News. 
Korea's military court has sentenced a 23-year-old soldier to death for a shooting rampage last June that killed five soldiers. Delivering its ruling on Tuesday, the court acknowledged the soldier, identified only by his family name Im, was young, has no previous criminal record and had a hard time at school. However, the court also stressed Im had showed... Uh, no remorse and continue to blame others for his actions. The military court said it was compelled to sentence him to death due to the gruesome nature of his crime. The defendant is expected to appeal. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, Koreans in their 20s and 30s are being warned to think very seriously about their retirement plans because a new report shows that, as it stands right now, nearly half of them will have to work past the official retirement age of 65. And if the current... Job opportunities for senior citizens are anything to go by. The work will be part-time, low-paid and irregular. Uh, Huang Jie has the details. When 30-year-old Koreans become 65, the country's employment rate for the elderly is expected to top 40 percent, with more than 7.3 million people their age or older participating in economic activities. Now that points to a need for quality jobs for the elderly who are living in a country that has one of the most rapidly aging populations in the world. A recent report by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs says that the rise in the elderly employment rate comes as life expectancy increases while most of them are unprepared for life after retirement. Korea's life expectancy stood at around 77 years in 2002, but it's expected to rise to 82 and a half years in 2020. The country's elderly poverty rate, however, was close to 50 percent in 2010, the highest among OECD member states. The rate is also around four times higher than the OECD average of 12.4 percent. The report adds that more than nine out of ten Korean workers ages 65 or older had either temporary or part-time jobs in 2012. With more of the elderly expected to look for jobs in the future, it appears critical for policymakers to find a way to improve the job market for them. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, a new report shows more Koreans are choosing to put off tying the knot. The total number of marriages in Korea could potentially hit an all-time low for last year once all the data is in. Statistics Korea says that between January and November, 271,000 marriages were recorded. That's 30,000 under the amount recorded for the whole of 2003. And that was the year that saw the lowest number of marriages in Korea since related data was collected. The agency also forecasts the number of newborns to drop below 420,000 this year, and that would be a low not seen since the 1960s. Korea's passion for education is known around the world, but it does come with a hefty financial price. The average Korean family spends nearly 7% of their income on learning. However, the current Rather bad economic conditions are prompting many parents to cut back significantly, especially when it comes to funding their kids' overseas schooling. Now, Kim Jion has more. There are chimes at midnight, but high school students in Korea are often still packed with students studying their textbooks. Some shell out big money to follow a separate curriculum offered by private academies in addition to their class materials. It shows just how much Koreans prioritize education, as attending a good university has a tremendous impact on a person's career. However, in recent months, the bad economy has started to have an effect on how much Koreans 
spend on education. In fact, the Bank of Korea and the Education Ministry say private academy expenses tumbled to a three-year low last year. During the January to November period, money spent on private education academies dropped 0.8 percent from the same period last year to 7.3 billion U.S. dollars. The number of students studying overseas also dropped from 262,000 in 2011 to less than 220,000 last year. Overseas education spending plunged 14 percent last year compared to the previous year amounting to $372 million, a nine-year low. An official from the education ministry says students are heading to English-speaking countries with lower living expenses. The number of Korean students studying in Western countries has waned. In particular, those in Britain have dropped by nearly 60 percent. In stark contrast, Korean students studying in the Philippines jumped 52 percent to more than 7,000 last year. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now, major advances in science in recent years allow parents to know the genetic makeup of their unborn babies, which is uh, very useful for when it comes to identifying risks for potentially uh, devastating diseases. But some worry this research will one day lead to so-called designer babies. Our Shin Semin reports. Parents pass on their characteristics to their children. And sometimes that includes traits they don't want them to have, like diseases. Researchers at the Oregon Health and Science University have been working to help prevent the passing of inherited diseases on to the next generation. So far, they say their test research with monkeys has been successful. This will work in humans because uh, we've tested in, in other primates, non-human primates. Um, so this is as close as it can get. The focus of their work aims at extracting abnormal mitochondria from the DNA that is passed on from a mother to a child. Although mitochondrial diseases are rare, once inherited by a baby, it's often detrimental. There is no treatment for inherited mitochondrial diseases, and only few live into the adulthood. Research is still ongoing, but ethical concerns are being raised about whether such a medical technique may be used to create designer babies. If it is our opinion right now that we can correct the children this way, um, that means that we become the uh, manufacturers of new generation. For the medical industry, the success of this research could help make the next generation more healthy and disease-free. However, fears linger that such an advancement could be misused by expecting parents who also want to play God. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Time now for a look through some of the other global headlines we're following this Wednesday morning from Seoul. For that, we turn to Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. We are keeping our eyes on the new Greek government. Its finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, on a tour through Europe, indicated that he could see an end to Greece's financial crisis by June. He made the statement following a meeting with his Italian counterpart in Rome on Tuesday, assuring skeptics that exiting the crisis could could be done given that everyone calms down. He asked for a bridge agreement that would give Athens time to work out an agreement on a realistic roadmap to pay off Greece's 240 billion euro bailout, that is about 272 billion US dollars. The new anti austerity government has ditched its initial demands for a debt write off or swapping out its debt for new growth linked bonds. Finance Minister Vadofakis heads to Frankfurt on Thursday for a meeting with ECB's president Mario Draghi before sitting down with his German counterpart in Berlin. And in the first of its kind, UK lawmakers have approved a medical procedure that would allow for the creation of babies using DNA from three individuals. The measure passed at the House of Commons Tuesday after heated debate. The technique would be applied in mothers with mitochondrial deficiencies to stop the genetic disease from being passed on using a modified version of IVF. It takes 0.1% of the 
donor mother's DNA. Health Minister Jane Ellison called the measure a bold but a considered and informed step, while critics said it crosses a fundamental ethical boundary and could lead to designer babies. Up to 2,500 women in the UK could be affected by the measure, according to estimates. It faces a vote at the House of Lords. And finally, another alarm near the White House. This time, a suspicious package found in a nearby park caused the streets near the U.S. president's residence to be closed down for a time. The unattended package was spotted in Lafayette Park. The north lawn of the White House was put on lockdown as D.C. police were dispatched to evaluate the package. The White House was also locked down last week, you'll remember, when a small drone had crashed into its its grounds. And a good Wednesday morning to you all as we kick things off with the Korean national football team where after months of no rest and just trying to prepare for the 2015 Asian Cup, head coach Ubi Stilke is finally set to get his well-deserved rest. Now, the 61-year-old who was named the national team head coach last September will leave to Spain next week and will rest for three weeks before returning to Korea in time for the start of the 2015 K-League season. And from there on, his busy schedule continues on as he's set to focus on the domestic talents once again before a set of A matches in March, followed by the second stage of the World Cup qualification matches in June. And as head coach Silke stated, the end of the Asian Cup is just the start of things to come. Now there's the age-old question, would you rather be a big fish in a pond or a small fish in the ocean, right? Well, for Korea's Lee chung Young, when the ocean is the English Premier League, you would rather be a small fish in the ocean. Now the South Korean international who was in the England's second-tier championship league with the Bolton Wanderers will return to the English Premier League as Crystal Palace purchased his contract just before the end of the January transfer window. Now a win-win situation for both teams as Bolton sells the striker before his contract expires and Crystal Palace, who is currently in 13th place, gets the much-needed offense. Now MLB.com had Pittsburgh Pirates Kang Jong-ho as the fourth biggest steal of this offseason after investing just $16 million on the former Nexon hero. Well, a steal is only as good as the number he's going to put up, right? Well, according to MLB.com, he's projected to hit 266 with 12 home runs while driving in 45 RBIs and even stealing five bases. And while many don't expect him to start off the new season as a starter, he's still ranked higher than Jordy Mercer in the 2015 shortstop ranking. Now, expectations remain high for Kang Jong-ho as he continues his training with the Nexon Heroes in Arizona. Now, the Lotte Giants in the KBO have some of the greatest fans in the league, but those fans aren't too happy with the way that the team is run, which is why those fans are hoping to purchase the Lotte Giants. Now, a movement has started in order to make the Giants into a citizens team, meaning a team owned by the public and those who purchase the share of the team. And their goal is to gather 300,000 fans to invest 300,001 or roughly 270 U.S. dollars each and gather a total of 90 billion won or roughly 81.8 million U.S. dollars. Now the only problem is the Lotte Giants aren't willing to sell the team and have instead taken this recent movement as a wake-up call to improve the team operations. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Uh, it's Ipchun today marks as the beginning of the spring, but we still have to wait for a month or so to fully enjoy spring-like temperatures. Uh, today we are kicking off with the lows on the negative side, similar to yesterday, and highs will be slightly cooler due to lots of clouds. Though right now the skies are looking clear and rain clouds are dropping showers to Busan and near the area at the moment, but that should let up sure 
shortly as the day goes on and sunshine will be mixed with increasing clouds. Also, the level of fine dust particles could go up a bit higher than the normal level, so please bear that in mind. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. So the daily low here in Seoul is kicking off at minus 3. Then the daytime high will peak to 4, while Daegu rise to 8 and Gwangju and Busan both top out at 6 this afternoon. And as for the other regions, Jeju Island will rise to 6 and Daejeon and Dokdo both should see a high of 5 and 3 respectively. That's all for Korea and here's international weather for viewers around the world. That's going to do it for now. Korea Today is coming up at 7 a.m. Korea time. Have a great day and do stay tuned to Arirang. Goodbye.